Okay. Welcome to a live episode of Pilates Elephants. And we're going to uh, attempt the brave feat of visualizing the anatomy of the hip and knee uh, on a non-visual medium. Now, I know some of you are watching this um, live and some of you are watching it after the fact. And if you're listening to this on a podcast app and you want some visual aids, go check us out on YouTube because this uh, is available, on, will be available on YouTube and uh, will be include all the visuals. All right. So, uh, and those of you in attendance, um, I'd love to have any questions as we go along, just pop them into the chat and I will uh, answer them as, as we go. So uh, the, the goal here is for you to get clear on which muscles stabilize the knee so that you can use this. Uh, when you have a client who has a, an issue with their knee, you know what to do and how to do it. All right. So if you're not clear, just pop in a, a question and um, we'll, we'll talk it through. All right. So which muscles stabilize the knee or also known as why simple exercises can solve complex problems. So uh, I'm going to take you on a little tour of the muscles and ligaments or some of the ligaments of the knee and visualize, make a picture in your mind of each of those structures and come to understand how the various parts contribute to the stability of the knee. And uh, then at the end, we're going to put all of that together and figure out which exercises are going to be helpful for people with knee stability issues. So first, we need to get clear on what we mean by stability. And I think uh, stability is a term that is very commonly used in the Pilates and rehab world. Uh, I think we've infrequently define what we mean by stability. Uh, and so I think a lot of us use it without really being clear on, on what it is that we're talking about. So uh, the definition of stability in the New Oxford Dictionary is not likely to give way or overturn, firmly fixed. Um, and I think that is a pre pretty good uh, definition, so not likely to give way. Uh, and in terms of the knee, we think of the two big bones of the knee being the femur or thigh bone and the tibia or shin bone. And the knee joint is the joint between the femur and the tibia. And so in terms of the stability of the knee, what that means is the tibia and the femur staying in contact with each other with the, the, the correct parts of each bone being in contact with the correct parts of the other bone. So they're not kind of sliding forwards, backwards or sideways relative to each other and they're not pulling apart. So basically keeping the right part of the joint surfaces in contact with each other. Now, so... You know, is, who is knee stability a problem for? Well, you know, most of us, it's not a problem at all uh, because we have, you know, brilliant systems and lots of backup systems to keep our knee stable. And we'll talk about some of those. Uh, but it is a problem for people when they have an injury to some of those stability systems. So um, the main passive stability system that we have in the knee or in every joint, are our ligaments. Ligaments are tough bands of connective tissue that connect bone to bone. And each ligament stabilizes a joint, so it prevents the joint from pulling apart in one particular direction. So if there's a, you know, if you think of uh, the, imagine the knee joint, looking from the side view and just make it the femur and the tibia 
Okay, so this long thigh bone with kind of a two bulbous ends at the bottom, and then that connects with the long, thick shaft of the tibia, which has kind of widens out to a plateau at the at the top. Okay, so the two bulbous ends of the femur sit on top of the plateau of the tibia, and there is a ligament inside that knee, right in the centre which joins the tibia to the femur, and it's called the anterior cruciate ligament. And it runs from the back part of the femur down and forwards towards the front part of the tibia. So it kind of runs obliquely or diagonally from the back of the femur to the front of the tibia, from the back of the thigh bone to the front of the shin bone. Can you picture that? And that ligament prevents the shin bone, the tibia, from sliding forwards, okay? Can you picture that if there's a ligament in between those two bones that runs from the back of the femur to the front of the tibia, that as the tibia slides forward, that ligament would become tight and would indeed stop the tibia from sliding forwards. So that's an example of a ligament stabilizing a joint in a particular direction. So each ligament uh, typically stabilizes a, a joint in one direction, and if the joint moves in the opposite direction, the ligament becomes lax, becomes you know, loose. Okay, so the anterior cruciate ligament becomes loose if the tibia slides backwards on the femur. And so the anterior cruciate ligament won't stabilize the knee against a force that pushes the tibia backwards, and so we have a different ligament, the posterior cruciate ligament, that does that. So... Stability means the ability to basically not fall apart, to keep the joint, the right part of the joint surfaces in contact with each other. Ligaments are tough bands of connective tissue that surround each joint, and typically each ligament will stabilize the joint or prevent the joint from coming apart in a particular direction. Okay, because it becomes tight when the, when the joint moves in one direction, becomes loose when the joint moves in the opposite direction. Now, we also have a lot of other backup systems to stabilize the knee. And uh, most of those systems involve muscles. So we're going to talk about those in a moment. Um, but just to cap off the first part of this, this thought is I want to just touch on, you know, when when is it, why is it important to know which muscles stabilize the knee? Well, we've got these ligaments that stabilize the knee. And for most of us, we go through our whole life never needing to ever worry about knee stability because our knees just work. Um, and even when we get, say, pain in the knee, that's, the knee's not necessarily unstable. So unstable means that, you know, the bones are not staying you know, the right parts of the bones are not staying in contact with each other. The knee is essentially, you know, flapping around or moving in in some way that is, you know, um, you know, it's moving too far in one direction or another. And that can only happen when one or more of the ligaments are damaged or stretched because the ligaments, they're, you know, one of their primary functions is to prevent the bones moving too far in a given direction. So the anterior cruciate ligament prevents the tibia moving too far forwards. So if the tibia was to move too far forwards, that would only be possible if the anterior cruciate ligament was injured. So when it so when we need to understand the muscles that stabilize the knee, um, the situation in which we need to understand that is when one or more of the ligaments are injured. So the ligaments can't do their job to the extent that they usually do. So you might have an injured anterior cruciate ligament, might be completely ruptured, or it might just be partly, uh, you know, partly torn, or it might just be stretched a little bit. So it might be uh, completely unable to stabilize the knee, or it might be less able to stabilize the knee uh, if it's injured. And so uh, in that situation, we need to rely on our backup systems. Uh, in this case. The muscles. So let's think about the muscles that stabilize the knee. All right, so let's think firstly about 
you know, the ones that I, I imagine you've probably already thought about, which are the quads and the hamstrings. Now, the quads and hamstrings, uh, let's just think they, they work together to stabilize the knee. They also work separately to stabilize the knee. Well, let's think about how they function together. So the quadriceps are on the front of the femur. Okay. And if you picture the femur from the front view, okay, it's this long uh, cylindrical bone. And at the bottom, there's kind of a bulbous prominence at each side. Okay. The femoral condyles, those are called. And those are the parts that attach to or that sit on top of the tibia. And that's where a lot of muscles attach to. And you can feel those in your own knee. If you put your fingers around the sides of the knee joint, just above the joint line, you'll feel bony hardness under your fingers. Those are the femoral condyles. And if you've ever got a marrow bone from the butcher, which is the femur of a cow, you will have seen those two big femoral condyles. At the top of the femur, there are, it kind of forms a Y shape, like a letter Y. Towards the outside, there's a big bony bump called the greater trochanter. And to the inside, there's a short shaft with a ball on the end of it, which forms part of the hip socket. And the, the shaft and the greater trochanter form, you know, roughly a letter Y, capital letter Y. Now, in front of that greater trochanter, there's something called uh, the trochanteric line, and that is where the most of the quads arise from, or the vastus medialis and vastus lateralis arise from. So you've got these two muscles, one on the inside front, one on the outside front of the femur, the vastus medialis, vast middle muscle, and the vastus lateralis, the vast outside muscle, which, uh, which attach at that intertrochanteric line, which is basically where the neck of the femur joins the shaft of the femur, where the, the two diagonals of the letter Y join the vertical of the letter Y. That is where the vastus medialis and the vastus lateralis two of the four quadriceps arise. And then you've got the vastus intermedius, which attaches right down the front of the femur. And then the rectus femoris, which attaches to the anterior superior iliac spine, which is the poke outy bit at the front of your pelvis. Like a lot of people might think of it as the hip bone. So you've got this rectus femoris attaching to the anterior superior iliac spine, and then the vasti, the vastus medialis, the vastus lateralis, and the vastus intermedius, which arise from the front of the femur. Now, all four of those muscles insert into a common tendon in the form of the patella. Okay, the patella is a bone in the middle of the quadriceps tendon, which inserts into the tibial tuberosity, which is about an inch below your knee. If you feel on the front of your tibia, you'll feel a little bumpy prominence in the front of that tibia bone, about an inch, inch and a half below your knee. That is the tibial tuberosity. That is where your quadriceps insert. They attach there. And so the quadriceps pull upwards and forwards on the front of the tibia. And you've also got the hamstrings at the back of, at the, back of the leg. Now, the hamstrings originate from the ischial tuberosity, your sits bone. Okay, that kind of round donut-shaped prominence at the base of your pelvis. So you can feel it. If you stick your hand under your butt and press up hard, you'll feel the bony prominence. And it's called your sits bone in a layperson's terms because literally when you sit, that's the part of you that you sit on. So the sits bone, the ischial tuberosity. And so all of the hamstrings, the three hamstrings, originate from there. But the, the biceps femoris and the semitendinosus also share a common tendon that becomes the sacrotuberous ligament, which attaches to the sacrum. So the hamstrings originate from the ischial tuberosity and the sacrum. Then they insert down below the knee. So the biceps 
femoris attaches to the tibia, sorry, the fibula, my apologies, the fibula head, the little prominence on the outside of your knee. So if you feel down on the outside of your knee, just below the joint line and just behind middle, you'll feel a bony bump there. That is the head of the fibula, the smaller of your two shin bones. And that is the attachment of the biceps femoris, one of your three hamstrings. Then the semitendinosus and semimembranosus, the two medial hamstrings, they attach down below the knee on the medial side. So the, the semimembranosus attaches to the tibia uh, directly, and the semitendinosus has a common tendon with a couple of other muscles that we'll talk about in a minute. So all of those muscles attach below the knee on the fibula and the tibia, and they cause the knee to flex. Okay, so maybe I haven't told you anything really revolutionary. The quadriceps extend the knee and the hamstrings flex the knee. But when you think about if we co-contract the quadriceps and the hamstring, so we contract them all at the same time. So we try and flex the knee and extend the knee at the same time. Well, what happens then? Well, picture it. If picture the knee being straight, okay, and picture the hamstrings pulling up on the tibia and the fibula, you know, pulling the tibia and fibula directly up, then think about the quadriceps simultaneously pulling up on the tibial tuberosity, that little bony bump just below the kneecap, okay? So all of those muscles pulling up the front of the tibia and pulling up the back of the tibia. So what happens there is the tibia doesn't get flexed or extended, it just gets pulled in tight to the femur. Right, So those muscles pull the femur and the tibia together. And in fact, that is the same at pretty much any knee joint angle. So uh, what we find, um, for example, in a squat movement, right, when you, you're extending your knee as you stand up out of a squat, the hamstrings are active right through that movement even though they're not actually providing any power, they're actually working against the quadriceps, right? So they reduce the amount of total force that you're able to produce, but they're very active because it's important that they're active because they help to stabilize the knee, right? Because when you co-contract the hamstrings and quadriceps, you get this synergistic effect of sucking the, the tibia into, you know, into contact, into more contact or more firm, firm, more firm contact with the femur. Can you picture that? All right, so the hamstrings and quadriceps co-contract to stabilize the femur. Now, can you imagine, stabilize the knee. Now, can you imagine that if you had an injured anterior cruciate ligament, okay, that ligament that runs diagonally from the back of the femur to the front of the tibia, okay, and can you picture that if the tibia, if there was some kind of force on the tibia that tended to push the tibia forwards, to slide the tibia forwards, that that anterior cruciate ligament would normally prevent that. But if the anterior cruciate ligament's injured, well, then the anterior cruciate ligament is not going to prevent that as much. So there will be more movement of the tibia. The tibia will be able to slide forwards. But... If you co-contract the quadriceps and hamstrings, okay, you not only pull the tibia upwards into the femur, but you also center it on the femur because the hamstrings are pulling backwards and the quadriceps are pulling forwards. So the total force or the net force is it pulls inwards, right? It centers the tibia within on those femoral condyles. So the, the co-contraction of the hamstrings and the quadriceps can stabilize the knee in multiple directions. I'll also prevent it from being pulled, the tibia from being pulled backwards or sideways because they pull, you know, from both front and back and they pull from both left and right. You've got an inner hamstring and quadricep and an outer hamstring and quadricep. So we're pulling the knee uh, towards the center like guy ropes around a tent pole, right? There are multiple guy ropes in multiple directions, holding that tent pole very rigid and stable. It's the same. You think of the, the femur and the tibia as the tent pole and the hamstrings and quadriceps as the guy rope. So co-contraction of hamstrings and quadriceps is very uh, exerts a strong stabilizing force on the knee. All right, so when you have a 
anterior cruciate ligament injury or really any injury of any ligament injury of the knee, which reduces stability. So a posterior cruciate ligament, a collateral ligament injury, or even a meniscal injury, anything that compromises the stability of the knee, strengthening both quads and hamstrings is going to be important. But it doesn't stop there. Because uh, higher up from the knee, there are some other muscles that have a profound influence on the knee. And I'm going to uh, switch to a visual view now. So those of you uh, watching on YouTube or live, uh, here is my favorite anatomy text of all time. This is the TM Atlas of Anatomy. And so here are the quadriceps. You can see there's the greater trochanter, there's the femoral shaft, Sorry, femoral shaft, femoral neck. Here is the vastus lateralis, the vastus medialis, the rectus femoris, and the vastus intermedius is underneath there. And you can see the vastus, sorry, the rectus femoris attaches here to the, oh, sorry, did I say the anterior superior iliac spine? I misspoke. It was the anterior inferior iliac spine that it attaches to. All right, and here they are all in, in, at, inserting into the patella tendon there. So, but what I want to show you now is a group of hip muscles that also profoundly influence stability at the knee. And I'm talking about the glute max and the tensor fascial arta. So if we look at this side view here, I picture the leg from the side view, okay, with the muscles on, there's the gluteus maximus, the butt muscle at the back. And then the tensor fascia larger at the front, so the side of the front, just behind the anterior superior iliac spine. Okay. And the glute max originates from the back part of the iliac crest and the, the, the side, the edge of the sacrum, okay. and also the lumbar dorsal fascia. And about 80% of the glute max fibers, so four-fifths of the fibers of glute max insert into the iliotibial band. Only 20%, the very bottom 20% of the fibers of glute max insert into the femur directly. So most of, almost all of the, the fibers of glute max insert into the IT band. The IT band is this tough band of fibrous connective tissue that runs down the side of the thigh. And it is really, uh, in one sense, it is the tendon, the common tendon of the gluteus maximus and the tensor fascia lata. Okay, So if you think about this on your own body, put your if you put one hand on your common glute max, which is the, the outer rear part of your hip, okay, and the other hand on your TFL, which is kind of the front outer part of your hip, okay, and then bring your hands uh, so that the fingers are you know, pointing down diagonally so that they meet at a point roughly where your greater trochanter is, the, the bony prominence in the outer part of your hip. Those two muscles coalesce to form a common tendon called the IT band. Now, it's interesting to me, uh, and I hope it'll be interesting to you, that we you know, pretty much never think of the glute max and the TFL as being like the same muscle. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I imagine you've never heard anyone say that. You've never thought it. Um, but for something, you know, like for other muscles that have a common tendon, we think it all the time, like the gastrocnemius, for instance, the calf muscle, right? It has a lateral head and a medial head. And those two heads, which have separate, completely separate attachments, one of them attaches to the medial femoral condyle, one of them attaches to the lateral femoral condyle, and then they coalesce to form a common tendon in the form of the Achilles tendon, Okay, but we never think of those as two separate muscles. We always think of the gastrocnemius as one muscle with two heads, or the biceps muscle. Okay, the long head attaches to the supraglenoid tubercle. The short head attaches to the coracoid process on the scapula. Okay, they form to a common tendon that attaches into the, the radial uh, tuberosity. Okay, but we never think of the biceps as two muscles. We always think of it as one muscle. However. The gluteus maximus and the tensor fascia lata, which coalesce to form a common tendon in the form of the IT band, which inserts into the 
anterior tibia, like we never think of those as the same muscle. But in a very real, you know, practical sense, they are the same muscle because they share the same tendon. So anyway, I mean, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> uh, it's purely kind of an, an academic sort of thought exercise. But I think it is interesting. To me, it's quite fascinating to think about these muscles that we think about like gastrocnemius and, and biceps are two-headed muscle, whereas glute max and TFL, we never think of that. We think of them as two completely separate muscles. But really, they 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 functionally often work together because they co-contract to stabilize the knee, as we're about to see. All right, so the IT band, the iliotibial band, which goes from the ilium, the hip bone, down to the tibia, the shin bone, it inserts, it runs apart across the knee joint and then kind of curves slightly forwards, right? So it runs vertically down the side of the thigh. Okay, and then just below the knee joint, it curves slightly forwards and inserts just on the outside of the tibial tuberosity. Same place the quadriceps insert into the tibia. And it runs kind of diagonally forwards across and below that knee joint. Okay. So when the tensor fascia lata and the gluteus maximus contract, Okay, the tensor fascia larger pulls diagonally up and forwards. The gluteus maximus pulls diagonally up and backwards on the iliotibial band. Okay, so the TFL pulls it forwards, the glute mac pulls it backwards. The net force, the net result is it just gets pulled upwards, right? Just like we said with the quadriceps and the hamstrings when they co contract, okay, pulls neither forwards nor backwards, it pulls straight up. Same with the TFL and the glute max. When they contract, they end up pulling the IT band straight up, okay? Which then ends up pulling the tibia slightly backwards and upwards, okay? And if we could have a X-ray vision and looked inside the, the knee joint from the side view, what we would see is that the anterior cruciate ligament runs from the back of the femur down to the front of the tibia, and it runs almost exactly parallel with those final fibers of the IT band. So the IT band runs almost exactly parallel to the anterior cruciate ligament, which means that when you tense your glute max and TFL, your IT band becomes essentially a functional anterior cruciate ligament. It does the same job at the knee as the anterior cruciate ligament. So it's an active backup system. The glute max plus TFL into the IT band are an active backup system for the anterior cruciate ligament, they do the same job, but where the anterior cruciate ligament is a passive structure, you can't, you know, consciously tense your <laughs> anterior cruciate ligament. It's not, it doesn't have any contractile tissues in it. Whereas the IT band, which is a tough band of connective tissue, just like the ACL, right, just like the anterior cruciate ligament, but the difference is the IT band is the tendon of the glute max and TFL. It's not, it's not just a passive structure. It has these active components, the two big muscles of the hip. So when you tense your glute max and your TFL, you stabilize the knee and, you know, and prevent the tibia from sliding forwards. So if somebody has some kind of compromise to their anterior cruciate ligament, you know, they've got anterior cruciate ligament strain or rupture or tear or, or whatever, not only is it important to strengthen the quadriceps and hamstrings, it's very important also to strengthen the glute max and the tensor fascia lata because they feed into the IT band and they directly, uh, which directly essentially duplicates the the function of the ACL in terms of the force that it uh, imparts on the knee. Right, so I hope all this is making sense to you. So, so far, 
if somebody has kind of some kind of instability in their knee, for example, an anterior cruciate ligament injury of some kind, okay, but really this applies to any knee injury, right? So if it's a medial collateral ligament, a lateral collateral ligament, posterior cruciate ligament, a meniscal tear, all of these things, the same stabilizing uh, functions apply. So, so far, if somebody has an anterior cruciate ligament injury in their knee, okay, we'd want to strengthen the quadriceps and the hamstrings and the glute max and the tensor fascial lata. Okay, so basically the quads and the hamstrings, the hip flexors and the hip extensors. Now, the glute max and the, and the IT band, and the, sorry, TFL, are also hip abductors, right? So we'd want to strengthen hip abduction as well. All right. Let's think about the other side of the knee, okay? We've talked about the IT band inserting into that outside part of the tibia, just lateral to the tibial tuberosity, okay? Those fibers kind of come straight down the side of the thigh, and then they kind of angle down and forwards and insert into the outside of the tibial tuberosity. If you can feel your own tibial tuberosity, okay, that little bony bump about an inch, inch and a half below your knee, just to the outside of that, that is where your IT band inserts. Now, the IT band has many insertions, okay, but that is really the the distal or far end of the IT band just at that outside part of the tibial tuberosity. Let's think on the inside part of the tibial tuberosity now. So pretty much just in a mirror image position of where the IT band inserts, There is another structure. Let's see if I have a picture of it here. Okay. This is really a mirror image on the inside of the tibia, on the inside of the knee. There is another tendon that exactly sort of mirrors the fibers of the IT band, but just on the inside part of the knee, and that is called the pes anserinus. And pes anserinus means goose's foot. Pes is foot, and anserine means goose. So the pes anserinus, which is the common tendon of the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus muscle. So those three muscles, the sartorius, which is a hip flexor, the gracilis, which is an adductor, and the semitendinosus, which is a hamstring, they all form a common tendon. So they have one tendon. So in another, again, in a very kind of real functional sense, these three muscles, the gracilis, the sartorius, and the semitendinosus, tendinosus, it, it, it is not incorrect to think of them as a single muscle with three heads. It's a triceps. Or you could think of them as three different muscles. They all insert into this pes anserinus, which of which the fibers run exactly parallel to the ACL from a front to back direction. They run diagonally down and forwards. Okay? And so when the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus contract, they pull on that pes anserinus, the tendon, the common tendon of those three muscles which pulls up and back on the tibial tuberosity in the exact parallel direction from the side view that the ACL exerts force on the knee. So when you have an injury to the ACL or really any other part of the knee structure that destabilizes the knee, co-contraction of the sartorius the gracilis and the semitendinosus is an important part of that stability mechanism. And if we think about the IT band on the outside of the knee and the pes anserinus on the inside of the knee, okay, think about the same effect as when we activate the quadriceps on the front and the hamstrings on the back. The net result is we pull up and out on both sides. Okay, So that means actually the, the pulling outwards and the pulling inwards kind of cancel each other out. And now we're just left with sucking the tibia up and into the femur. Okay, what the technical term is we approximate those bony surfaces. So when we co-activate the glute max and the TFL, okay, 
with the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus, okay, we stabilize the knee even more at really any joint angle. Right? Now, the sartorius is a hip flexor. It inserts on the anterior superior iliac spine. Okay, let's take a look at that. There is the sartorius, originates on the anterior superior iliac spine and travels down diagonally across the front of the leg, forms a common tendon with the gracilis and the semitendinosus and inserts into that pes anserinus on the medial side of the tibial tuberosity. So if you palpate, if you feel your tibial tuberosity with your fingers, and then just slide your fingers just a little bit to the inside, that is where your sartorius, your gracilis, and your semitendinosus insert. Okay. Now, the gracilis is an adductor muscle. Okay. It's on the inside of the thigh. It arises here just you know, basically on the pubic symphysis, just below the pubic symphysis. Okay. And if we look from the side view, we see the gracilis, the inside view, the gracilis here, and here it coalesces into this common tendon, okay, with the sartorius, and there is the semitendinosus. And so we have in this pes anserinus, we have sartorius, which is a hip flexor. The semitendinosus, which is a hip extensor, and the gracilis, which is a hip adductor, all stabilizing the knee. Now, the final thing I want to leave you with here before we finish our tour of the muscles, because we don't have time to do a complete tour of all of the muscles, <laughs> but I think we're going to hit all of the major ones here. We are going to hit all of the major ones. Final thing I want to think about is gastrocnemius, your calf muscle. Right, one of your calf muscles. And the gastrocnemius has two heads, like I mentioned a little bit ago. It's got a lateral head, an outside head, and a medial head, an inside head. Okay. And the they insert, do you know where they insert? They insert into the tops of the femoral condyles, at like the back sort of top of the femoral condyles, right? So the gastrocnemius crosses the knee. It inserts into the femur. And then the two heads coalesce to form a common tendon, the the Achilles tendon or the calcaneal tendon is the proper name, which inserts into the calcaneus, the bony bump at the back of your heel. Basically, your heel bone is your calcaneus. That's where the Achilles tendon, the calcaneal tendon inserts into. So the gastrocnemius pulls down and back on the femoral condyles, right? And it pulls up and forwards on the calcaneus. So the gastrocnemius, as you know, plantar flexes the angle, it points the toes, it also flexes the knee. And it also pulls the tibia forwards or the femur backwards relative to each other, right? So it does it does the opposite action of the anterior cruciate ligament. You know, the anterior cruciate ligament prevents the tibias going forward. The, the, cal the gastrocnemius pushes the tibia forward. Or another way of saying that is the gastrocnemius prevents the tibia going backwards. Right, so it synergizes, does the same thing as the posterior cruciate ligament, which we haven't talked about, but and we won't talk about that today, but it's just the equal and opposite of the anterior cruciate ligament. So we have the gastrocnemius, which also crosses the knee and crosses the ankle, okay, and which exerts a force on the femur, which pulls the femur backwards and downwards relative to the tibia. And thus, when you contract the gastrocnemius, it, it does uh, cause a, uh, it can stabilize the knee against the tibia sliding backwards, right? which can happen, for example, at, oops, let me, let me let me rephrase that. Uh, and there are forces on the knee, for example, at the bottom of a deep squat, pushing the tibia backwards. 
Uh, so it's useful to contract your gastrocnemius at the bottom of a deep squat, and that's why you automatically do that to help stabilize the knee. It synergizes with the posterior cruciate ligament. So we have muscles that stabilize the knee. We've got the quadriceps, the hamstrings, the glute max, the TFL, the sartorius, the gracilis, the gastrocnemius. Now, we've, there are a couple of others we haven't mentioned, but they're very small muscles. We're going to leave them out for today, okay? Popliteus, etc. cetera. Um, now, if we think of that list of muscles that we just talked about, okay? Glute max is a hip extensor. TFL is a hip flexor. Sartorius is a hip flexor. Glute max and TFL are hip abductors. Sartorius is a hip abductor as well. Gracilis is a hip adductor. Hamstrings are knee flexors. Quadriceps are knee extensors. Gastrocnemius is a knee flexor. Glute max and, and biceps femoris are hip lateral rotators. TFL is a hip medial rotator. So we have muscles that strengthen, or muscles that stabilize the knee, include hip extensors, hip flexors, hip abductors, hip adductors, hip lateral rotators, hip medial rotators, knee flexors, and knee extensors, and ankle plantar flexors. The only action you can do with your leg that doesn't directly involve muscles that stabilize the knee is ankle dorsiflexion, right? Pulling your toes back towards your shin, right? The muscles that do that don't stabilize the knee, right? But any other action you do with your leg, you point your toes, you rotate your knee left or right, you extend your knee, you flex your knee, you flex your hip, you extend your hip, you abduct, adduct internally or externally, rotate the hip. All of those actions are going to involve muscles that stabilize the knee. All right. Now, here's where we get to the part where simple exercises can solve complex problems. Because there is one exercise that will strengthen every single muscle that we've talked about today. And that is a squat or a lunge or any other pushing movement that involves the whole leg. Right, so let's think about a squat. Okay, it could be footwork on a reformer, could be a lunge, which is just half a squat, could be a step up, could be any kind of movement where you are pushing with your lower leg, with your whole leg, sorry. So think about standing up from the bottom of a squat. Think about the joint actions that are occurring. Okay, we're extending the hips. We're extending the knee. We're extending or plantar flexing the ankle. So we're working you know, a lot, the glute max, the quadriceps, the gastrocnemius. Okay? We're also working the adductors a lot because in deep hip flexion, the adductors become hip extensors. Now, I don't have time to go into that today, <laughs> but maybe that'll be the convers conversation for another day. So in a squat, you're working your hip extensors, your knee extensors, your ankle, ankle plantar flexors, and your adductors. Now, you're also working your abductors because you need to stabilize your, your torso, like your, your pelvis and torso, from collapsing sideways, right? Now, this is even more the case if you do a single-legged lunge or step up. You work your adductors and your abductors even more, but you work them pretty hard, even just in a bilateral two-legged squat. So in a squat, you're working, you know, directly working your glute max, your, t uh, your, your quadriceps and your gastroc, plus your gracilis, and you're also contracting your hamstrings, your sartorius, your TFL, you know, all of those muscles that we mentioned. So... To strengthen all of the muscles that stabilize the knee, do a squat or a lunge or a step up or a footwork on a reformer or any whole leg pushing exercise. Okay, whole leg meaning you're using your ankle, your knee, 
and your hip. Now, you could also, you know, add in a few little things like maybe some supine leg raise work, you know, like the hundreds or, you know, lying on your back or raising your legs, et cetera, to work the hip flexors even more because the, the hip flexors are going to be, yes, they're going to be active in a squat, but it's not going to, you know, majorly strengthen them. Okay. So if you did some supine leg raises or something else that works the hip flexors, okay, that would be of further benefit. But just doing a squat or a lunge or a footwork or a step up, some kind of whole leg push is for, you know, the vast majority of people, you know, I'm talking about people who are not elite athletes, right? But just anyone who's just recreationally fit or someone who's like sedentary and recovering from some kind of knee injury, okay? Just a squat or a lunge or a step up is going to do the job. And so... We've come full circle, and uh, even though there are a plethora of muscles which stabilize the knee, in fact, pretty much every muscle that crosses the knee and most of the muscles that cross the hip and some of the muscles that cross the ankle all stabilize the knee. But the good news is there's one, you can just do one exercise to work all of those muscles, and that is some version of a squat a lunge, or a step up. All right. Thanks so much for being part of this. That's what I wanted to share with you. When you have clients who have an ACL injury or a PCL injury or a tibial collateral ligament injury, you can very effectively rehabilitate them with just a graded version of a squat, a lunge, a step up, a footwork. When I say graded, I mean starting, you know, at their whatever their current level of capacity is, you know, from very gentle on up, and then gradually progressing the challenge, you know, going, increasing the range of motion, increasing the load gradually over time as they become stronger. So thank you so much for being part of this and uh I hope this was helpful. Love to know your feedback. If you're listening to this, you know, how did it translate to an audio medium? Um, if you watch this on YouTube, was that useful? If you watched it live, was it useful? Uh, you'll find my Instagram uh, profile in the show notes. You can DM me on Instagram and I will reply to you. Love to know your feedback. All right. Thanks very much and have an awesome rest of your day, night or whatever. See ya.